located out here on Skidway Island. The Marine Education Center and Aquarium is part of UGA's Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Graham. And I'm, I'm very excited to spend some time with y'all today to explain a little bit about what I do and some of the goals that we have here in the aquarium. So everything on display here can be found on the Georgia coast. Uh, we, our goal is to showcase local species and habitats in order to get people excited about them, you know, and want to learn more about them. Uh, the aquarium is also used for all of our education programs, and we work with our partners such as the Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, Georgia Department of Natural Resources, and the Skidaway Institute of Oceanography to raise awareness about coastal issues. Collectively, again, we all want to spark an interest in people to keep learning and foster attitudes of environmental stewardship through education and conservation. So the aquarium itself, the aquarium itself is actually laid out to represent a cross section of the Georgia coast. So imagine if we're starting in offshore areas of the ocean with live bottom reef habitats like Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, and we're going to trek towards the land till we get to inshore areas of the salt marsh estuary. Now, all of the animals or all of the fish and invertebrates and a few reptiles found in each tank are typically found in those respective areas. Now, some of the species are transient between the areas and many of them will start their life cycle off in Georgia's estuaries as a nursery habitat before they move offshore as adults. So now we're gonna sorry, sw switch screens here. We'll go for a little trek. So and Devin, I think that you might still be on your computer. Sorry. Thank you all. This is our first summer of doing virtual programs. So thanks for hanging with us as we navigate technology. Awesome. So you might need to put Devin in speaker view again um, as soon as he is unmuted. And in the meantime, if you have any questions about our aquarium, please add those to the chat box and we'll be sure to answer them. And Devin, I believe you still are on mute. All systems go now? All, All right. systems are good to go. Thank you. And for Sorry. folks that have just Others. joined us, for folks that have just joined us, you'll want to make sure that you put Devin in speaker view and you can do so by hitting the button on the upper right hand corner of your screen. And I'll turn it back over to him as he walks through the front area of our aquarium. All right. Thank you, Kayla. Sorry for those technical difficulties. Um, so as aquarium curator, I'm responsible for the, our animal care and husbandry program. Um, I work with other aquarium staff to make sure every single daily task is completed in order to provide a healthy environment for all of our animals. I'm also responsible to make sure all of the seawater systems and filtration systems are running like they're supposed to. So here we are. Headed to the behind the scenes area. You can see that all of the tanks are actually open on top, which is how we access the tanks to, for feeding and cleaning and um, things like that. There, there's one tank back over here that actually has a curtain around it. This tank has a curtain because the water level only goes halfway up the viewing window. So that means that people that are on the public side can actually see through the behind the scenes area, what we sometimes call the back of the house. It also means that we can see down to the public. Oh wait, who's that guy? Oh look, it's me, PVC Devin. Back when I used to have more hair. This tank actually represents uh, Tidal Creek in Georgia's salt marshes. And we are currently featuring 
in this tank. Two Diamondback Terrapins we've named Harry and Voldemort. These are really special characters because they're one of the few aquatic turtle species that tolerate brackish water. Brackish water is a mixture of fresh water and salt water that occurs in the estuary system. So they live in tidal waters of Georgia. And they eat things like feather crabs, mussel, and snail. Thank you, Voldemort. Harry is hi hiding off somewhere, probably just taking a nap. Okay, so as we walk through the, the back of the house, you can see and probably hear from the noise that every tank has its own filtration system. They're running constantly to make sure every, the, the water is constantly being cleaned, and that's how we provide excellent water quality for all of our fish. One of the fun parts about my job is that I get to design and build all of these filtration systems. So some days when I'm here, I'm a plumber. Some days I'm a carpenter or some days I'm an electrician. And it's really fun for me because I like to work on different kinds of projects, things like that. So on the, this back wall behind me, we have some extra tanks that we use for quarantine or general holding purposes. So when we get a new fish, We'll put it in one of these quarantine tanks, to monitor its health. Um, speaking of, I have a question for y'all that you can type in your answer into the chat box. But my question for you is, how do we get new fish here at the aquarium? So think about that. You can type in your responses, and we're going to circle back to that at the end of the program to answer any questions about it. I will give you a hint that we do not buy our fish from the pet store, really. And I would also like to say that we do have permits with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources to acquire new animals in various ways. So think about it, we'll circle back to that a little bit. Right, so there's something very special that I'd like to share with you all today in our quarantine area. All right, now, we actually have some little baby skates. These skates were actually born here. Um, the skates are cartilaginous fish that are related to sharks and rays. And um, we have, in one of the display tanks, we have an adult male and female that have been mating and reproducing successfully for several months. So some days we'll come in in the morning to find two new egg cases in the display tank that look like this. They're always laid in pairs. And then so when we find the pairs, we'll scoop them out of the water, put them into this holding tank where the egg cases, the young will actually incubate inside the egg cases for about 10 to 12 weeks. Once the skates hatch out, this one did overnight, actually. We'll scoop them out, take some measurements, and then move them into a larger tank with the others that are, I guess, are technically their siblings. So right now, I'd like to show you another fun surprise. And if you look very closely inside this egg case, you can see what looks like a tiny little worm attack, attached to the egg yolk. That little wormy thing squiggling around is actually a baby skate. So this is a really new egg case that was just laid about two weeks ago. And then like, compare that to this egg case that was laid about nine weeks ago. And if you can see, it's sort of hard to tell, but the skate is much more fully, fully formed inside. 
earlier I was shining the light on it. I could see its eyeballs, but it looks like it's turned upside down inside the tank. All right, so we've got some movement there. And that, that is actually the tail, just the tail of the entire skate. There still is some egg yolk left, but it, where it gets its nourishment. And if you look over here on the right side, you just might be able to make out its dark eyeball. So again, so again, once the egg, the skates hatch out of these egg cases, we'll scoop them out and put them into the other tank. If you're wondering what the beads are for, we actually put coated beads on each egg case when we scoop them out of the main display tank to know who's who and we can guesstimate when they're about to hatch out. Well, also in the display, I mean, in the quarantine area, sorry, we have two red lionfish. We're currently renovating their display tank, but we actually have these lionfish here at the UJ Aquarium to raise awareness about invasive species. And, you know, explain to aquarium visitors sort of the harmful impacts that they're causing to local ecosystems and, you know, communities on the Georgia coast. Those spines on their, on their backs, the dorsal spines and the spines in their pectoral fins on the side are actually laden with venom. So it would be a very bad day for anyone to step on that, or it might be a very bad day for a larger fish to try to bite one of those. Right, so you can see that we have a few more quarantine tanks behind me. Now, standard quarantine period is about 30 days. So like I said, we'll get a new fish, put them in tanks and monitor their health. And we also want to make sure that they are sort of healthy, disease-free, parasite-free, and eating well before we introduce them to one of the display tanks. If we need to, we can also give them some fish medications while they're back here in quarantine. But we really want to just make sure they're healthy and we want to address any issues they have back here before we introduce them to the display tank. Now moving fish around or you know, moving fish from quarantine to display is a lot trickier than it sounds. There are actually several factors that we have to consider. So number one, we need to think about habitat preference. Some fish, might prefer sort of a 3D structure based on their morphology or behavior. Others might prefer sort of an open flat bottom area. Another thing we have to consider is available space in each tank. So you know, if we overload a tank with too many fish, the filtration system can't really keep up with it and the water then can become sort of toxic and cause the whole system to crash. One of the last things we want to consider about quarantine is the size of each fish. We want to make sure that we um, don't put fish in tanks that are going to become snacks for other larger fish. You know, we want to make sure that tank mates aren't eating each other. So, for a little game that we have, um, we're going to play a game called Fish Tetris. When we're moving fish around, my curie, uh, um, curator colleague, Lisa Linders, Cole Belanchik, <laughs> likes to call this Fish Tetris because it's always a moving target. So, here's the first question. If you were had my job for the day and you were about to move a flounder, where would you put the flounder? In a sandy bottom tank or in a rocky bottom tank? And for our participants, you'll notice that there is now a live poll. So you can go ahead and select if you think it's sandy or rocky. And in just a minute, we'll share those results with you once we've given everyone a chance. It looks like we've got 19 responses so far at 2021. And if you can't find the poll, that's okay. You can just type your answer in the chat box as well. 
Awesome. We've still got answers coming in. We're at 25 responses. I'm going to go ahead and share what people thought. So it looks like about 88% of the people or 23 people thought that you would put the flounder in a sandy bottom tank and 12% thought you would put it in a rocky bottom tank. All right, way to go, everybody. You did a great job thinking about the needs of the, the flounder there. It's a flat fish that likes to spend most of the time on the bottom or it likes to have open sandy areas. All right, here's a fish tetris part two. Which of these two fish go together in a tank? The mullet, grouper, or spotted sea trout? And you will notice a new poll has launched. And so you can go ahead and put your answers in there. Do you think the grouper and sea trout go together, the grouper and the mullet, or the mullet and the sea trout? And if you're not sure what those fish look like, you can move that pole screen around on your device so that you can see the pictures of the three fish that we are talking about. Awesome, it looks like we've got over 20 responses coming in already. We'll give it just 30 more seconds to get your, get your answers in. If you're playing Tetris, how are you going to fit these fish together? Who's going to get along well in a tank? Awesome. It looks like we've had some great responses. Um, I am going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results so that you can see what everyone thought. It looks like we had 63% of people thought that the grouper and the sea trout would go together. 22% thought the grouper and mullet would go together and 15% thought the mullet and the sea trout would go together. All right. That's great. The majority of the people may have recognized that the grouper and the spotted sea trout are sort of a predatory fish. And the mullet might become a, a yummy snack for those predators if they're actually put in the same tank together. Good job. All right, now we're gonna head back to the food prep room. We're gonna discuss more feeding for our animals. But right now, I'd like to do one more fun little pop quiz for you guys and ask you a question. How often do you think we feed our fish, or animals here at the aquarium? You can see the responses. It's two times a day, every day, three times a week, or once a week. And every other week is our fourth option as well. Oh, thank you. So if you're on a phone, you might need to scroll a little bit to see all four options. But it looks like we do have some answers coming in. We'll give it just a few more seconds um, to let more folks answer. It looks like, looks like just about everyone has answered. I'm going to end the poll and share the results with all of you. It looks like the most popular answer was three times a week, followed closely behind by two times a day, every day, and then a handful of folks thought it was once a week. So Devin, what would you say is the correct answer? I would say that everyone is correct. Way to go. Good job. It's sort of a trick question, but we actually have to cater to the needs of each individual animal to make sure that they're getting proper nutrition. So sometimes that means feeding and animal every day or twice a day every day like our loggerhead sea turtle um once a week or every other week might be something like the snakes that we have on uh, in the back and then most of the main characters are fed every monday wednesday and friday so to explain a little bit more about um you know how an aquarium feeding we're going to show some videos for you All right, you can see that every tank has its own food container, which helps us monitor the amount of food each animal receives. Now, 
On the cutting board, you can see some locally sourced shrimp and squid that we prepped for meals. All right, this is an example of broadcast feeding. That's one method that we employ in the aquarium here. Um, after you know, prepping the food into little bite-sized pieces, we'll sort of just scatter the food around in each tank. And that way it ensures that every fish has a fair chance of getting something to eat. This is a view from the front side of the tank. And you can see that the fish are all being very active right now, like they know what's gonna happen. Now they know that it's feeding time. And the fish in this tank are, we have a few red drum, Atlantic croaker, and blue fish. And those oyster bags, that are in the tank are also there to replicate an oyster reef restoration. Here I am getting a nice handful ready to broadcast to the, another tank. The brown pieces that you see in the food bar are something called gel food that we make in house. And it's just a mixture of fish meal, gelatin, and supplemental vitamins and nutrients that we mix all together, or cook and mix all together to make sure every animal is getting proper nutrition. Again, this is another front side view. Um, this tank represents a live bottom reef habitat with some black drum, sea bass, blue runners, and trigger fish. Now here's an example of something that we do called target feeding. We place a piece of food on the end of a feeding pole to target one specific animal to ensure they are getting their food. We usually broadcast feed in combination with target feeding, which also helps to distract some of the fish that might try to steal the target piece of food. So from the front side of the tank, you'll see that I'm trying to target a long nose gar. Sometimes it can be a little finicky in terms of eating. So we will sort of wave the piece in front of the gar to entice it. Here's it. So now I'm going to target feed one of the adult fear no skates that I mentioned earlier.
here's a piece of gel food for the skate. I think this view of the tank really shows how target feeding helps us get the food down to the fish that feeds more along the bottom compared to others that can feed from the uh, mid water column all the way down to the bottom. Right. So, uh, speaking of the clear nose skates, we do have a program about sharks and rays coming up later this uh, summer. So, be sure to tune in to check that out. Well, there's one more character that I'd like to introduce to y'all today, sort of the superstar that we have here at the aquarium, and it's Neptune, our loggerhead. This is how we see Neptune. Uh, Neptune is one of those characters that is fed twice a day, every day, and the amount of food that she receives is based on a portion of her body weight. Right now we're feeding about 1.25% of her body weight each day. If you want to learn about why I called her a she, you make sure that you tune in to our program next week, uh, next Tuesday at 11, to learn all about Loggers Head Sea Turtles. And some of the methods that we use here to care and provide enrichment for our body. Mm -hmm. right. But now I'm going to put a little what I would like to call a shrimp sickle here in the tank for Neptune. It's just another a form of food enrichment to help stimulate her into feeding, running around, chasing her food. Good job, Thank you. So again, um, next week's program is going to be all about loggerhead sea turtles here at the UGA Aquarium, the types of enrichment that we uh, employ for our care. So now we are going to circle back around to sort of the question, one of the questions that I asked you all in the beginning. And um, I think, Kayla, you might want to, are you going to give some responses that we've had for the question of how do we get our fish here at the aquarium? Thanks, Devin. We got a number of, of answers, including from the store, from the river, from the ocean, rescues, and then from the wild right here in the Georgia coast. All right. Well, good job, everyone. Those are all um Right on the money, we employ a, a variety of methods to go out and, and collect our animals. Like I said, we have permits with the Department of Natural Resources to do so. So we will go out ourselves to collect all the fish and animals, and we can use a hook and line, like a traditional fishing method. Sometimes we'll use nets, like seine nets, cast nets, dip nets, trawl nets, any kind of net you can think of. We will also trade and with other aquariums in close proximity sometimes. Um, that way we can you know, use living educational resources from another facility 
uh, and continue using them without releasing them or taking more from the wild. So good job everyone with that poll. Um, and at this time, I think we're gonna also open, start to open it up to some questions that anyone might have. Yes, and we've had some fantastic questions coming in through the chat box throughout the whole program. So if it's okay with you, Devin, I'll, I'll ask some of the ones that have already been added in the chat box. And then if folks think of other ones that you're curious about or if his answer sparks another question, feel free to keep adding those to the chat box. Um, and if we run out of time, we'll be sure to follow up by email as well with, with answers. Um, so our first question um, is Aiden would like to know how many, the number of animals in the aquarium and as a follow-up, why don't the fish eat each other? Those are both great questions. Um, so the number of animals that we have in the aquarium can, can change from time to time. Right now, I would say that we have ab about 200 animals, like, including all of our invertebrates and coastal reptiles that we have in another holding area. Um, the question of why don't the fish eat each other um, has to do with that fish Tetris game that we played. Um, so we are, we are very careful when we are introducing fish into different tanks and we'll make sure that they're all about the same size or have the same sort of temperaments and behaviors and like to eat some of the same things as well. Thanks, Devin. Um, we had a couple of questions specific to the skates, the baby skates that you showed us behind the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. One of them was how long does it take those skate, once you have the egg cases, how long does it take it for them to hatch? That's another great question. And so once the, the eggs are laid um, by the mama, it takes about 10 to 12 weeks for the babies to, to grow inside, grow and develop inside. And then once they hatch out of the tank, they are a fully formed skate, just the miniature version of their adult. That's so cool. And it's been so cool to see them see them hatch out. Um, Nina was wondering, so are all of the animals that are in those quarantine tanks, are they all born here the same as the skates or, or where else are you getting those animals if not? Uh, no, those aren't, aren't um, all born here. But, you know, when, like I said, when we go out and collect new fish, uh, so if Charles uh, or Ned were fishing for a new species of fish, when we catch that individual, we'll bring it back here to the aquarium and put them into the quarantine tanks. So, um, you know, it's just a standard method to sort of monitor their behavior and make sure we're not introducing any um, germs or anything like that into the, the display tanks, which can affect all of the other fish. Wonderful. Um, thanks for that insight. And then we also had a question um, about how big the skates get, the clear nose skates that we have in the aquarium. Oh, um, well, the adults are about two feet across, like from wingtip to wingtip, and about three feet long. Awesome. Really cool animals. And again, if you want to know more about sharks and rays, tune in later this summer because we've got a whole class just on those really cool organisms. Um, we also had a question about sunlight. So someone was noticing that all of these animals are indoors and that it looks like there's artificial lights over the tanks. So can you tell us a little bit more about, about that side of it? Uh, well, like you said, there are lights over all of the tanks. And there's a fair amount of sunlight that comes through the viewing window of each tank, um, you know, from our other uh, external windows to the outside area overlooking the bluff. And so we will actually time all of the lights to keep sort of a diurnal pattern for all of the fish. And Neptune had an extra set of lights over its tank that were, had a very strong UV um, spotlight. Um, UV radiation, UV light is very important for proper growth and development of the sea turtle's carapace or shell on its back. And so we, we really make sure to include that for all of the reptiles that we have here at the aquarium. Um, awesome. And we, we had a question about the lionfish. The two lionfish that we have here, where did they come from? What's their backstory? 
Oh, that's a great question. Uh, those two lionfish were actually uh, harvested or collected from the Florida Keys, uh, which, you know, so lionfish prefer sort of a warmer um, climate. They're used to sort of tropical and tro subtropical areas of the Indo-Pacific region. That's where they're actually native. So um, their invasive range here in the Atlantic or Western Atlantic Ocean really goes from the Caribbean through the Bahamas into the Gulf of Mexico, all coasts of Florida, and then up the eastern seaboard of the Atlantic Ocean. So to collect those lionfish, we would just work with a um, professional team based down in the Florida Keys and arrange for them to be collected, packaged, and then shipped to us overnight. Um, so you just never know what's on that UPS truck. That is an exciting package to get in the mail. Yes, it uh. is. <laughs> That's how we've also or, um, got our seahorses here before. Um, so every, every animal really has sort of a story about how it gets here. And um, they're always you know, very special to us. I know this is probably hard to pick, but do you have a favorite animal in the aquarium? Ooh, I, that is a very hard question to pick um, right now, just because it can change from time to time. Um, you know, I have to say that I, I love Neptune and all of our sea turtles. Uh, I, w I think that my, one of my favorite fishes right now is the Atlantic guitar fish that we have. It's related to sharks rays and skates and it looks like it's somewhere in between all of them so i think that's my favorite right now that is a really really cool fish um we had another question about do you release any animals back into the wild um yes we do and there's sort of a, a standard procedure for doing that um we'll take uh the neptune for example a loggerhead sea turtle so once neptune has sort of outgrown our facility um, we start feeding her live food so things that are naturally occurring on her menu like blue crabs mussels spider crabs um, things that she has to sort of forge for or try to catch and eat herself and before we re release neptune we can we'll just make sure that she can do that proficiently up on her own, and it's usually very easy for them to make that switch. Um, we'll get them checked out. We'll get all our sea turtles checked out by a wildlife veterinarian. And then once they get the clean bill of health, we will get permission from the Department of Natural Resources and U.S. Fish and Wildlife to release our loggerhead sea turtles. Um, sometimes we'll release our fish as well. It's not as uh, strict of a process um, just because they're not federally, federally protected species. Um, but we do get permissions from DNR to sort of release the fish. And then again, if we can, we will offer our fish to other aquariums in close proximity. So we work with the South Carolina Aquarium in Charleston. We've also worked with the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta uh, to transport the fish that we have, the large fish that we have to their facilities where they can continue to be living educational resources. Thanks, Devin. Um, I believe that that is all of the questions that we've had come in on the chat box. If I missed any, um, please feel free to copy and paste your question again into the chat box so that I see it. Um, and if not, I'll put my email in the chat box as well. And if you think of more questions for Devin, uh, feel free to, to email them and we will get back to you as well. Um, oh, we do have, we have a couple more questions coming in. One was, what kind of sharks um, do you have at the aquarium? Well, we, we currently do not have any sharks. Um, we have had bonnethead sharks here before. They're the smallest species of hammerhead and they actually do well in the size of tanks that we have. So that's sort of a goal that we're, we have for this summer to potentially collect a new bonnethead shark. Um, but again, we also have the guitar fish, 
Atlantic Stingrays, and Plano Skates, all of which are cartilaginous fish related to each other. Thanks, Devin. Um, sure. And one more question. Um, they're curious about how you transfer animals. And I'm not exactly sure, but they might mean in between, like in between tanks or in between aquariums, potentially. Sure. So if we're go just going from tank to tank, uh, we first want to check to make sure all of the water quality parameters are the same. So we'll check the salinity or salt concentration between two tanks to make sure they're the same, we'll make sure the temperature is the same, and then prepare sort of a secondary container that we can scoop the fish out you know, from one tank, put it into the water of another container, and wheel that to the next tank before we scoop it back or dump it back into the new tank. Um, now, um, so traveling or transporting fish long distance is a little trickier because we have to provide that mobile life support and have used a cargo van to sort of ship our fish before with a large container of water, seawater in the back. Um, and we just bring extra aerators and pumps to make sure the water is cycling and has plenty of dissolved oxygen in it during, during the trip. Thanks. And there was some clarification in the chat. That was what they were wondering about was between the aquariums. Okay. Um, so that, that's cool to hear about. Um, and similarly, someone was asking um, if you could, could get any animal uh, transferring either with another aquarium or collecting for the wild, what animal are you most excited or hope to get? in the future? Ooh, that's, um, that's a great question. And uh, I would be very excited to get a new octopus. We've had several octopuses here before and they're just really charismatic creatures. They're highly intelligent and just fun. Uh, we use a lot of enrichment toys for the octopus and we'll, that will drop into the tank that have different shapes and textures that it sort of tries to feel and manipulate. And um, they're just a, uh, an amazing animal to watch and always a crowd pleaser. Yeah, that would be very exciting. Um, I know that we had a few more questions, um, which we may, if we don't get to it, um, we'll try to follow, you, follow up with you afterwards. Um, I do want to add that we would really like to get your feedback. This is the first summer that we've done programs um, and your experience of these virtual programs and feedback on how to improve them. Um, we really will listen to you and incorporate um, I've added to the chat box a Qualtrics survey. It only takes about a minute to complete. Um, I will add that our chat box will disappear once we end this meeting. So you may either want to go ahead and click on that link now, or you can just copy and paste it into a new uh, browser window as well so that you have it when we, um, when we close the meeting. You may have seen that I also added into that chat box some links for activities that you can do at home. So one of our marine education fellows, uh, Maggie, put together an activity using um, recycled and upcycled materials that you might have in your recycling. So using some shoebox and cardboard and other uh, crafty things, you can create a diorama that represents um, our aquarium here at, uh, at UGA Aquarium. And I believe that the, the models that she has are based off of our Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary tank. Um, and she's also got a time-lapse video that you can click on and see. Um, and you can also access both of those at-home activities from our website as well. Um, and before we sign off, I do also want to give a big thank you um, to our friends program. And you may be able to see... Um, Well, our screen might not be showing here, but if you're interested in how to become a friend of the aquarium, you can go to our website, which is listed here at the bottom of this slide. Um, and you can also connect with us on social media or join us for future programs. Um, our next programs are gonna be this Thursday, one for four to eight year olds. And then if you had fun with Devin today, uh, join us next Tuesday at 11, because you'll get to meet um, the other aquarium curator, uh, Lisa Kovalanchik, um, and Maggie as well for a talk all about animal enrichment, going a little bit more in depth on that. Um, 
Any last words for the group, Devin? No, I'd really just like to say thank you for joining me today. I always love sharing with people, you know, what it is that I do and what it takes to keep the aquarium running. Um, thank you so much for your time and thank you for all of your excellent questions and responses. Well, thank you all. And again, just a reminder to fill out that one minute survey if you have a minute. Um, and we hope that you enjoy your lunch and the rest of your week. Hope to see you next week. Um, see you later, alligators. Thanks. Bye-bye.